You're welcome. This is Wes Bailey speaking to you for Park Avenue Produce. In the next half hour, we're going to take you from the ridiculous to the sublime, to the sublimely ridiculous, to the ridiculously sublime, and back again. I hope we've outdone ourselves this time in our aim to bring you exciting alternative variety programming. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Vernon D. Push for the beautiful opening credits, which he stayed up all night to design on his Texas Instruments home computer. And also a very special thanks to all of our Park Avenue stars. I think you'll be seeing some of your favorite old stars tonight and, of course, some very fresh produce, which I think you'll find very interesting. Our first feature was written by and stars a newcomer to Park Avenue Produce, Mr. Steve Whittlesey. It's titled I Married an Alien and is based on a true story literally torn from the pages of the National Examiner. Steve's co-star is Miss Cindy Payson Desmond, who some of you hardcore Park Avenue Produce fans may remember from her stellar performance as Rona, the Waitress of the Damned, from the motion picture of the same title. I Married an Alien was directed by Mr. Ben Ziola. The videographers are Ms. Tani Freeworld, Mr. Vernon D. Push, and myself. And the lighting design is also by Mr. Vernon D. Push. Ladies and germs, Park Avenue is proud to present I Married an Alien. days off work. Do you want to do it? Gee, honey, do you really mean it? Yeah, let's get married. You made me the happiest woman on earth. And me the happiest man. so much more beautiful with your hair down. You're out of this world. You're so pretty. I got you something.
What's the matter? Don't you like it? Oh, no, it's not that. I'm just startled. I can, no, I I can take it. it back. No, 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 no. Are you sure? Yeah, honestly, I love it. Would you put it on for me? Yeah, I'll go put it on right now. I'll wait for you. Okay, honey. I'll be right back. Bye. Let me look at you. Uh, I love you. I love you always. As a footnote, we'd like to thank Mr. Federico Fellini for inspiring the soundtrack to I Married an Alien. And now a feature that I'm particularly proud of. This is a new Park Avenue produce series that I conceived, directed, and edited, entitled Women in Command. I'd like to express a very special personal thanks to Ms. Tanny Freeworld, who helped me to co-produce this series. And before I turn you over to Ms. Freeworld for our first interview, I'd like to share with you a statement that she wrote concerning our hopes for the future of this series. The last 10 years have seen significant changes in working Nebraskans. More and more women are climbing the corporate ladder, competing in political arenas, and tackling non-traditional careers. Over the next few months, Park Avenue Produce will talk with some of these women to determine what skills and personal values have been most useful to them in their rise to power. So join us now as Park Avenue Produce presents Women in Command. I'm in Lincoln, Nebraska to spend a couple of days talking with Kandra Hahn. After receiving her Bachelor of Arts in English from Nebraska's Wesleyan, Kandra worked for a very brief time as secretary and then became news clerk for the Lincoln Journal. From her vantage point in the media, she was introduced to political life, and in 1974, she took a big risk. She quit her job at the Journal, ran for political office, and was elected clerk of district court, where she served for seven and a half years. More recently, Condra was gubernatorial candidate Bob Carey's media coordinator during his successful 1983 campaign. On the eve of Governor Carey's inauguration, Condra was appointed director of Nebraska Energy Office, where she supervises a staff of 40 and is charged with the task of conserving Nebraska's energy resources. In the course of her rise to her current political position, Kandra managed to continue her education and received her Master of Business Administration. Today, she lives with husband Don Hunter and daughter Candelyn Hahn in their beautiful Lincoln home, where she juggles the responsibilities of wife, mother, and political servant. Good morning. Good morning. I've been looking everywhere for the paper. You've got it. You've had it all the yes, time. Yes, I'm reading last night's paper. <laughs> last night's paper. Prop. Prop paper. Prop paper. <laughs> prop paper to match the naturalness of sitting in your own living room in front of the camera mm -hmm. with a microphone. With prop coffee. <laughs> with prop coffee. That's right. Don't drink too much. <laughs> we have to make it last. Kendra, I love your office. It's so personal. Um, so much of you has obviously gone into this. <laughs> well, I love the place and so I want to move into it. But I, the, what's wonderful about working in the Capitol is that you are working in a monument. And 
very few people get an opportunity like that. And I always think my dad told me when he was a little boy, he just used to dream about coming to the Capitol, and he just, how remarkable it is to be here and to work here. It's wonderful. Inspiring? Oh, yes. Yeah. Every day. I mean, you never get over it. It's great. Going back to when you were a little girl, uh, growing up in Nebraska, did mm -hmm. you ever envision that you would wind up working here <laughs> in the Capitol? No, I don't think uh, you, when I was growing up, we were really taught to envision or encouraged to envision much of anything. I mean, my parents were real wonderful about wanting me to achieve, but no, nobody ever encouraged you to make a decision about achievement. What were you going to do? What were you going to take in school? There was kind of notion that you'd go to school, but no real understanding why. As a supervisor for 40 people, was decision making one of the skills that you felt you were poorly prepared for uh, well, in this yeah. capacity? Um, yeah, skills is such an odd word to me because I never think that I have skills, but I'm always going along finding out things that I knew how to do turn out to be skills. And um, what I learned was how organizations work. I learned that through my dad's work, really working with my dad around the church. Uh, how do you run a group of people? Uh, how do you schedule things? How do you keep track of who's in your group and who isn't, that kind of thing? I was always encouraged to do stuff. I mean, as I said, you know, my dad took me into his business, the family business, the church, and, uh, and worked. But um, we clearly brought up to have people like me, and that's a constant daily battle because you can't do that. It cannot make a difference to me whether people like me or not. That's not what Governor Kerry needs from me. That's not what the people of Nebraska need from me. That is of no interest to them. Uh, I need to make decisions and make people work hard and stuff like that and love their work and whether people like me or not is, is completely irrelevant. Of course, I was brought up with that being foremost. Are you, do you still have to fight um, the desire to be affected by people's impression of you, whether they like you or Every not? Every minute. Every minute? Every minute. It doesn't Every, get any easier? No. Well, easier, yes, yes. but it never goes away. <laughs> never goes away. Yeah, that's deep. What, if you had to give your daughter one skill that uh, you think would hold her in good stead for almost anything she would want to pursue, mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you think that would be? Do it. Do it. <laughs> do it. Take the risk. Yeah. Leap off. Risk it. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's, I think she will do that. I think she has seen that. She will do it better than I did it. I'm not, I don't feel so positive for everybody. For one thing, um, the work I had as clerk of the district court was in, in that world of the, the divorcing people. And some people just don't do well in that. For me, divorce was a wonderful thing and a, a good experience. And, but some women don't accept it that way and they beat themselves and they, appear before their daughters as, and present themselves as ruined and, and not whole and, um, and know that that isn't good and that, that doesn't necessarily all set up a wonderful um, march into the future. And not all children are encouraged to be independent. I mean, many women bear the burden all by themselves. And I go to these awful meetings with these women who's primary role in their life was to be mother and wife, now stripped of the wife part, left with an impossible task of mothering, makes it impossible to do it on your own, um, earning minimum wage, not getting child support, the, the financial desperation of a single parent when it's a mother is awful. <laughs> and it's becoming now uh, a recognized social issue. I don't know if anybody's going to do anything about it. I worked in it for eight years, and it was just all, all impossible because uh, there's a tacit way that society accepts all that, that, well, women have brought it on themselves. There was something wrong with them. Uh, and men, in fact, do walk away from responsibility. They do walk away from their children. They don't want to be around them. I, I, get real, I don't want to hear about visitation rights anymore. It's all nonsense in, in the vast majority of cases. And uh, if, if the gist of what we're talking about is change, then I'm not optimistic that the change has occurred. Some, but not all. What worked for my daughter is that we were very honest about the relationship, and I let her know she was bearing part of the burden, and 
who knows whether how it's going to work out. She's turned out to be very serious. I worry about her being overly serious. I've, I've seen that a yeah. lot in children of divorce, a lot. She's gone away for the summer. One of the reasons I wanted her to go away for the summer and travel is I want her to not be quite so serious and not be quite so driven, and yet that's part of the relationship we grew up in. Her childhood's very, very different than mine. I was a single parent for 10 years, and that is, uh, it's, um, impossible. It's almost impossible. It's uh, the, the idea that millions of women are out there raising their children is almost unbelievable. It's the, the most difficult job. Uh, career building is nothing by comparison. <clears throat> nothing I do when I go in to direct the work of 40 people in my office compares with the difficulty of being a single mother with a child six years old. So parenting still comes down to the ultimate career, the, the most oh, difficult no, and the, well, and it's the, the most difficult. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I, I don't mean ultimate in terms of the only. I mean because uh, I didn't like the rewards of it either. Uh, I I love my daughter, mm -hmm. a wonderful person, mm -hmm. an incredible person, but have told her wasn't that fond of being the mother in the in the relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I. The, whatever the rewards are that some people see and enjoy and like so much were not there for me. Didn't like it. Um, and so that made for her being very independent. And of course, being in a second marriage and having married at 29 with a half-grown child and all of that, our, my relationship with Hunter is very independent. I mean, we married each other because we were independent, because we wanted independent careers. It is no shock that we are both gone all the time. Um, it's part of the relationship. It's part of what we wanted. You have to remind yourself sometime when you haven't seen him for five days, this is the life we wanted. I mean, we said that last night after he'd been gone all week. Um, and I'll be gone all next week, and we'll have like two days this weekend. And that's exactly what we said. You know? This is the life we wanted. And we do. We do. I miss him. Mm -hmm. um, but time together is wonderful then. Oh, well, Very it has sweet. to be quality. It has yeah. to be quality. Very sweet. The last 10 years have seen some changes in uh, particularly uh, working uh, Americans. Women are suddenly in supervisory positions and something that's rather unique, they are supervising men. Mm -hmm. Has that been a difficult transition for you to make? It is difficult. I don't know why, and I'm, I'm unresolved about how that works. Uh, some days I think I understand it, and some days I think I don't. Um, one of the things that saves me, and this is certainly something that's said with some scorn in the women's movement, is that I like working with men. I prefer working with men. I think that's part of why I ended up here. Um, it is more difficult for me to work with women, easier to relate to maybe, but harder to work with them. Um, so. Part of that is makes it easier. Um, but I still have trouble directing men. I'm very conscious of their egos, conscious of how they're feeling, more conscious of how they feel about what I say to them than they are, constantly, very sensitive to them, brought up to be. It's why it works for me. <laughs> it's why it makes it difficult to, to direct them. In Washington, for instance, I think you have a system where men who have fought each other and, and survived and succeeded at the local level have all sort of funneled into Washington to this high level of male uh, fighting and, and, and the best fighters and the feistiest fighters end up in Washington. And I was saying that it's like a, a bad case of testosterone poisoning throughout the capital. It's all, it hangs in clouds. You know, you know you're in a very male environment. And I don't think women have as good a chance at all as we do here. Where it's much more relaxed, and we have opportunities. So I'm always glad to come back. And all the nonsense about the women's movement being sophisticated and making inroads, and too bad, and we're backward, and we don't have the chance, is I think not true mm. at all. We're lucky. <laughs> well, I, <clears throat> I found well when I was in Washington, I. Uh, was there as a tourist, and the first thing I noticed was the the charge in the air. There was mm -hmm. something tangible there, 
and it's very exciting from a tourist point, mm -hmm. but you certainly would never consider staying there for any length of time. It's just too well, high to It's hard to in, I would guess. I don't know. I've not done it. It's, but the other side of all of that is the reason that, that people fight and, and scratch and claw to get there is because it then it's also a city that panders. It's very sensual, too. That's the other side of it. That's what's so wonderful about it, the, the wonderful food and the wonderful wine and the wonderful uh, way people indulge themselves after they've fought. In a, in a desperate indulgence to, uh, to, to, re to relax, to get away from it. For, for, for simple-minded Midwesterners, it's quite an indulgence. <laughs> you do it's yourself great. a great injustice. <laughs> the concept of control and dealing with men always seems to come back to question of body image. And uh, we hear a lot today about dressing for success. Where did you learn to dress for success? Because you look marvelous. Thank you. I don't, it's very conscious and very controlled. And if I were not in this position doing this, I would, you, I would never dress this way on my own. And uh, I break a lot of the rules and stretch the rules and, and, and not, I don't think I'm real good at it, but um, it works anyhow. Um, the bo whole body image thing for my peers and the women I work with, I think it is probably inconceivable to the men we work around how much of our energy that takes. I don't think they have any idea how bedeviled, and it really is like having devils in you, <laughs> how worried you are about that at all times. I'm 30% of my energy must go into worrying about how I look, thinking about how I look, dealing with how I look. And I don't, I know the men around me don't are not anywhere like that. And it's scary and it isn't and you know, all that stuff. So you have to deal with it. You still haven't told me where you learn. Do you study? Do you read? Do you um, uh, watch? Or do you just make it oh, up I've as you go along? Yeah, I've read the books. Mm -hmm. you know, read the Malloy books. Yes. <laughs> and uh, picked what it could of it. Picked parts of it. Part of what he says is right and part isn't. You, but you, you, you say this is not the way you would dress if you were g given your druthers. Oh, no, I'd wear flowing caftans and large jewelry and wear lots of eye makeup and be very exotic oh, every day. Yes. I'd get up every morning. Ba back. Maybe wear turbans or cut all my hair off or something. Well, I, I can do fine for a number of days in a row. I can dress like an adult. And then um, one day out of 25, I have a breakdown, and I dress the way I want to instead. And people relate to you very differently. I, a staff member come up to me and say, um, I wore, instead of the kinds of things you're supposed to wear to make other people feel OK about you, your position and what you do, I wore a dress that wasn't character, had no waistline, had no jacket, had no, wasn't the right color, wasn't a power color. And it just upset people. They didn't think it was right. Now, they came in and talked to me in sort of traditional terms about it, that it didn't make me look good. But I'm not sure that's what was going on. I think it upset them, it upset the power structure. and Upset, upset the routine. Yeah. So I don't like all of that. I mean, I don't like having to get up and put on my uniform. But you do, because it works. And that's why you do it. Do you I got one final question for you. What's your favorite color, and do you sleep in the nude? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. And now our closing piece, Death of a Sales Girl. This is a Cubist poem written by Park Avenue Produce's head writer, Ms. Norma Jane Doe, and set to music by Ms. Peggy Horrocks. Special thanks are due to Ms. Nancy Ahmed of the Souk Clothing Store in Omaha's own Old Market for the beautiful location. The video was directed by Mr. Dennis Murphy, and the videography is by yours truly, Death of a Sales Girl. She could not last that long. Last that
the end. Thanks for watching, and remember, public access programming is for everyone, even you. in television land wherever you are good night it's time to say good night thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you